Good evening. Welcome to our international speaker series. My name is Angela Zhang. I am the director of the Philip K. H. Wang Center for Chinese Law. Today, I'm very pleased uh, to welcome two guests. And one of the guests is um, Austin Strange, is the author of this book, Banking on Beijing, which have recently been published and attracted a lot of media publicity. You probably have read it in uh, a, a lot of um, news articles recently, and it was featured on, uh, on economies very, uh, Economist uh, very recently. And this book is about um, um, China's um, influence uh, and um, aid, both aid and debt financing in developing countries. Um, and we also have a discussant, um, um, Mac Riffman from uh, Harvard uh, Business School. So let me first uh, give a um, detailed introduction of the two guests. Austin is an assistant professor of international relations in the Department of Politics and Public Administration at the University of Hong Kong. Um, he re research and teaches Chinese foreign policy, international political economy, and international development. His research focuses on China's past and present roles in the world economy with an emphasis on China's relations with the developing countries. Um, last year, Austin uh, was a visit, uh, visiting fellow of Wilson China Fellow at the Wilson Center and previously was a fellow at um, the Columbia Harvard China and World Program. He, he got his PhD in government from Harvard and MA from Zhejiang University and BA from the College of William & Mary. I have to say that Austin is, um, among all the Americans I know, he speaks the best uh, Mandarin. I mean, he really speaks absolutely impeccable uh, Mandarin. So um, I'm amazed, uh, not just by this book, uh, but also by his uh, language skills. And uh, Mef Rifma is the F. Warren Mc. Fallen Associate Professor in Business Government International Economic Unit at Harvard Business School. She also holds a PhD um, in government uh, from Harvard and her primary expertise is comparative political economy and development with a focus on China and Asia. Um, her first book, which was published uh, by Cambridge University Press in 2015, entitled Land Bargains in Chinese Capitalism, examines the role of land politics, urban governments, and local property rights regimes in the Chinese economic reform. And she's now working on her second book, uh, which investigates the relationship between the capital and stake and globalization in Asia, comparing China, Malaysia, and Indonesia from the early 1980s to the present. Uh, so th her second book does have a lot uh, does relate to, uh, you know, very closely to our talk today. Um, her work also focuses on China's role in the world, including China's outward investment and lending practices and economic relations. And you probably have read uh, some of her recent work uh, in, in this area. So I look forward to the fun discussion um, between our speaker and, and the uh, discussant. And without further ado, let me give the floor to Austin. Great, can you see that okay? Yes, good. Hi everyone, uh, good evening. Um, thank you to the Center for Chinese Law for inviting me. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. And thank you to everyone uh, who, who showed up and who took the time to uh, come and listen. Um, so I'm Austin Strange. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about, as, uh, as, as Professor Zhang just said, a new book called Banking on Beijing, uh, the aims and impacts of China's overseas development program. And this is a, 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 an ongoing project with uh, my longtime collaborators, uh, Axel, Andreas, Brad, uh, and Mike. And um, time is limited. So what I'd really like to do today is just do four things. So I want to give, before I talk about the book, give a little bit of motivation and background for this project and kind of explain just briefly how uh, this all came about and why we think it's so important. Um, second, I want to talk about some of the data and the methods very briefly that uh, that made this book possible and that we've been working on for um, for over a decade now, which makes me feel old to say that. Uh, and then I want to talk about the argument of the book, um, which is all about the, this transformation that China's government has uh, gone through in the past two decades in the field of international development from being more of a donor towards being more of a, develop, a development banker. And then finally, talking about what that means for the field of international development, 
And what are the aims and consequences of Chinese aid projects and debt projects uh, around the world? So that's the game plan. Uh, I want to start with a very basic, but I think important observation and one that I imagine a lot of you are familiar with, <laughs> which is that uh, like a lot of things in the world today, uh, the topic of Chinese uh, development finance is extremely controversial and polarizing. Um, on the one hand, and we have sort of a spectrum where on one side, for much of the past two decades, China's government has been um, portrayed as almost a villain-like character who is doing a lot of damage in this area. Um, about 15 years ago, a very influential article came out in Foreign Policy magazine that uh, accused countries like China, uh, but also Saudi Arabia, Russia, Venezuela, of being rogue donors who really were only financing development projects in other countries to prop up dictators and extract natural resources and buy influence. Um, and in doing so, they weren't really helping the populations that were most vulnerable and that needed help the most. And they might even be undercutting the work that that Western donors and creditors have been doing. And more recently, I'm sure you've, you're more familiar with the debt trap diplomacy meme, which is, has, has kind of come out in the first decade of the Belt and Road Initiative, which was launched in 2013. And this meme goes back a few years ago and basically accuses China of strategically luring developing countries into its orbit, essentially, by having them sign off on um, opaque, massive infrastructure loans that are unsustainable and that cause these countries to rack up lots of unsustainable debt that then puts China in an advantageous uh, bargaining position. Another sentiment that has been around for a while when it comes to Chinese development projects is that China's government, it builds things quickly, but a lot of the projects it builds are economically questionable. They only benefit a very narrow segment of uh, the host society in which they're built. And a lot of these projects are white elephants. And so you could pull out lots of quotes that kind of reflect this sentiment in places like Washington, DC and in other capitals in, in Western democracies and in places like Australia as well. Now, of course, on the other end of the spectrum is a completely different narrative where China is almost a refreshing alternative to decades of relatively ineffective um, humanitarian assistance from, from Western donors and lenders. And China has a reputation for um, both with its policy banks um, and its, its um, contractors to be much more efficient and, and, and get things done in, in record time compared to other donors and lenders to build projects really, really quickly and to see results early and to attach fewer bureaucratic red tape and arduous kind of financial and economic policy conditions to its aid and loans. And then again, in the era of the BRI, China has this reputation now, I think, for being you know, the main provider of connective infrastructure. So building the hardware of development that a lot of Western donors and creditors have really shied away from in the past few decades. Um, and of course, this is the narrative you hear if you pay attention to what China's government says, uh, and in some cases, if you pay attention to what governments of, uh, of countries in the global south say as well. And so for much of the past two decades, we haven't really had a way to know which side of the spectrum is kind of closer to the truth, right? And, and one of the reasons why is that compared to other donors and lenders, China's government is a lot less transparent. It doesn't provide a lot of detailed information, certainly not uh, in a comprehensive way at the project level about uh, what types of projects it's financing and where they're going and what are the, the different terms uh, of, of this giving and of this lending. So it's one of the least transparent major donors uh, in, in the international system. And given this lack of official data that we have for a lot of other donors, I think one of the reasons we see this spectrum of opinions is that there's a lot of political opportunism um, and essentially cherry picking where if you really like Chinese aid or if you really hate it, you know, it's easy for you to pick out a few cases that, you know, anecdotes or uh, troubled projects or successful projects that basically fit your narrative and then extrapolate them and try to tell a story about, um, about China's role in development. But of course, that's not a very good way to do social science research. And so on the one hand, there's a long tradition of people trying to do it a different way and trying to track China's development projects, you know, one project at a time using uh, both official and unofficial sources, using open source approaches. 
But up until recently, we've never had really comprehensive um, quality data that represents kind of the known universe of China's development finance. And so this was the major evidence gap that my collaborators and I wanted to fill when we started this project, I guess, 11 years ago. And we've developed uh, what we consider to be systematic, uh, transparent, and really a collaborative method that's meant to be of use, uh, not just to us for, for the research that we do, but to governments around the world, to scholars who use different types of methods, to journalists, so on and so forth, to students, um, and build this kind of platform of uh, having a protocol to collect these data and then building project level data on, um, on Chinese global development finance. And so the data, if, if you're not already familiar with it, is housed at A Data, uh, which is a research lab at the College of William and Mary. That's where I did my undergraduate education. And all of the methods and the data and all that's available on, uh, on A Data's website. So I'm not gonna talk too much about this because I, I really wanna focus on the book, but um, long story short is that we built this method and then several iterations of this data set. The method is called Tracking Underreported Financial Flows or TUF. And since 2013, we've released, uh, again, multiple kind of updates of the data set. We've been extremely fortunate to collaborate with a, you know, an army of uh, undergraduate and graduate students and staff members and lots of other really smart researchers and scholars, uh, both at William and Mary, but also at a lot of partner institutions as well. Just to prove that this is all real, this is me uh, in 2013 doing some field work uh, for the, for I think for the initial, either the first or the second version of the data set. And we were basically going around in a couple of countries in Sub-Saharan Africa and, and, and trying to get a sense of all this data we collected with open sources, is it actually matching up with what we observe on the ground? And so this is also, this is a, shows you how old this data is because it's not a very sharp picture, the image, but, uh, but you can also, this is another example of, of how many different types of groups of people uh, were, were kind of helpful in, in building uh, this project. So again, I'm not going to talk uh, about the details of the kind of the, the method for the data because we just don't have enough time. But if you have any questions on that, I'm happy to follow up later. But essentially, the data that we use in the book is a project level data set of Chinese official finance. And it's built using open sources. Um, increasingly, we draw more and more on official government sources from China and from host countries. We also use unofficial sources like media reports, scholarly articles, NGO reports, things like that. And we made a couple of what I think are really important kind of interventions into this space when we built this data set. The first one was to, in introducing these data, make sure that we didn't call all of these projects, you know, foreign aid or just lump them into one category. Because a huge part of what we argue in this book is that China finances both aid projects and debt projects. And we wanted to be able to make apples to apples comparisons between China and say the World Bank or the United States and comparing kind of the effects of their, of their projects. So on the one hand, we capture China's foreign aid projects or projects that would look like foreign aid if we use definitions from the OECD and put in, in, in the Deve uh, Development Assistance Committee, the OECD DAC. And if we use their definition of ODA or official development assistance, these are projects like grants and donations and, and, and freestanding technical assistance that are very, developmental and concessional basically. But we also capture a lot of debt projects, which are what we think of when we think of kind of the big ticket infrastructure loans that are um, kind of the hallmark of the Belt and Road Initiative. And these, for a number of reasons, don't qualify as foreign aid in the traditional sense. These would qualify as other official flows or oof, uh, by, you know, according to the OECD's definitions. And then for some projects, we actually just don't have enough information to make this distinction, so we just label them as vague. Um, and so the data, the version of the data that we use in the book, um, it includes over 4,000 projects around the world uh, worth over $350 billion in commitments to over 130 countries. And we're primarily focused on this 15 year window between 2000 to, and 2015. And this is a, a useful window for us because it allows us to observe this evolution from being a donor to a banker for, for China's government. But I'll say a little bit about this at the end. These data have been extended. And I think a lot of the takeaways from the book, if you just look at what's going on in, in, in the media with, with uh, things like debt negotiations are, are even more relevant today than they were, say, five years ago. Um, so another key intervention we make is to follow the money. So we don't just assume that all these projects, once they're announced in the media or by the government, 
we don't just assume that they all happen just just as they were planned. Uh, that rarely happens in, in the real world, right? So we track the status of these projects. And for several thousand of these projects that we can confirm were either started and implemented or even completed, we're able to code the subnational locations of these projects as well. And that's an important part of our analysis later in the book because we look subnationally at where these projects go and what their effects are as well, not just across countries, but, but within them as well. So let me focus on the book in particular. Um, the main argument that we make is that, as I said, China has evolved over the past two decades, starting in the late 1990s, from being an aid donor, and that's what it was for much of the second half of the 20th century, to being a, a development banker. And what I mean by that is that debt now is the primary engine of China's development finance. And that has increasingly been the case um, since 2000. And again, just to be totally clear, debt here, I'm just using it as shorthand for things like loan-based infrastructure and other financing from China's policy banks. Aid projects are things like grants, and in some cases, very, very concessional loans, like interest-free loans that are that meet the kind of the threshold and the standard uh, of the OECD of, of being able to be called ODA. Um, and we argue in the book that this evolution from donor to banker is very closely tied to China's own changing national economic strategy, which we really you know, see start to take shape with the going out strategy um, in, in the late 1990s. And this shift has had really big consequences for a lot of developing countries. And the reason why is because aid projects and debt projects are completely different. Um, they look very different. They have different motivations. Uh, we go on to show that aid is mostly motivated by things like political interests and humanitarian need. Debt is much more commercially driven. And so these projects are very different, not only in their motives, but in their size, their scope, their location, and in their effects as well. And this transition from donor to banker has basically presented developing countries with a, a high stakes trade-off between short-term efficacy and both economic and political attractiveness of a lot of these projects in the short term, but medium and longer term risks um, because of all the different externalities that infrastructure projects generate once they, once they get financed. And so this has raised the stakes because the amount of financing has increased by so much. And again, um, I think these lessons are, are, are quite relevant if we kind of fast forward to 2022 uh, as well. So I wanna highlight just four major takeaways of the book um, with the rest of my time. Quickly, I just want to show what this donor to banker shift looks like. Um, then I'm going to turn to the allocation of Chinese projects, both separating out aid and debt, and look where these projects go kind of around the world across countries. Um, then I'll, I'll talk about kind of within countries, where do aid and debt projects go? And then finally, leave off with just what, are, what have we learned? What's the evidence say about um, going back to this debate of whether China is a good thing or a bad thing for global development? What are the consequences of aid and debt projects for developing countries? So in the past 15, 20 years, China has become what we call the lender of first resort. It's by far the world's largest bilateral uh, financer and, and provider of things like loan-based infrastructure. And if you look on the left side of this graph here or this chart, you can start to see this take shape. So on the left side, we just plot the total number of projects that China financed uh, all over the world over those 15 years. Aid projects are this dark uh, bar on the bottom. Debt projects are this middle gray bar. And you can see that by the middle of this period, you know, 2008, 2009, debt starts to creep up and represent a greater share of China's portfolio. But the shift is much more kind of dramatic and easy to see if you look at the right-hand side, which is the financial value of all, the, all these projects that are being financed. Um, and similarly, around 2009, 2010, we really see uh, debt-based financing start to take off and really start to dominate China's development finance portfolio. And China's evolution into primarily being a development banker makes it structurally different than the other major players, than the other major bilateral uh, donors and creditors uh, in the world. So over this period, the US and China in terms of their overall volume of government money for development projects were comparable. They were in the same ballpark, um, but less than you know 20 percent of what China's government financed and committed um, came in the form of projects that look like 
foreign aid. Whereas for the United States, for Japan, for Germany, for some of these big OECD donors, the vast majority of their financing is ODA or aid-like, right? And so this makes China look a lot different just structurally than, than, than a lot of these donors. So in terms of the allocation of these projects, um, one of the things we wanted to do in the book was put some of those assertions about the good things and the bad things about China's development finance to the test, because we finally have this, this you know, data foundation that we can use uh, to, to test some of these claims, right? And when it comes to China's foreign aid, so we started off by looking, where do, where do these projects go? What types of countries get aid from China? We found strong effects in terms of geopolitical motivations. So of course, countries that uh, recognize uh, Taiwan are you know, much less likely to get aid from China. Countries that vote more uh, in the United Nations General Assembly are more likely, uh, vote more, I should say, with China in the UNGA are more likely to get projects. Um, and importantly, that doesn't necessarily mean that China is unique or rogue. That actually makes China resemble um, the other major donors. There's a, a large literature in political economy that basically shows that most big aid donors use their aid to pursue you know, geopolitical influence. Um, and we didn't find any evidence that aid uh, flows more to countries with rich natural resources. And we actually find that poorer countries get more aid from China, which is, which is good news. The story is very different when we look at the allocation of debt-based financing, um, and it's a little bit more concerning. So these projects are much more commercially motivated, as I'll talk about in a few minutes. They tend to flow more heavily to larger countries that have um, more stability, um, that are more corrupt, and that are less democratic. And so in terms of its aid, China is not a rogue donor. If anything, it looks somewhat similar to other big donors. But Chinese debt is a little bit concerning. And we talk about a few reasons why uh, more corrupt countries might get more debt, debt based financing from China in the book. One phenomenon that I think is particularly interesting is that in countries uh, in which Chinese state owned enterprises already have an established market presence, there's this well established kind of pattern where uh, you know, local branches of these SOEs or local businesses will essentially get together with host country governments and kind of game the system and then go back to China's government and, and propose projects there. And that type of thing is probably uh, more likely to happen, you know, in, in more corrupt uh, environments. And so when you plot these results, um, you can see that, again, the allocation of aid and debt is completely different. So geopolitical factors are more important for explaining where aid goes. And these commercial, you know, commercially linked factors like stability, and institutions and corruption, and of course size are much better predictors for uh, where Chinese debt-based projects go. We also look at where these projects go within countries as well, using those data for which we have the subnational uh, locations. And this builds on some work um, that was done by my colleagues that basically argues that you know, one, one key difference in China's approach to financing development from a lot of the other major donors is that it pursues this aid on demand approach that basically affords host country governments and leaders more agency and kind of more influence over the selection of projects. And I think on the surface, that sounds like a good thing. Um, there's been a lot of criticism over the years about Western donors uh, basically being too bossy and you know, not, giving, not, not allowing enough input from host countries, government agencies and bureaucrats. But this has a, kind of an un unexpected, unintended negative consequence, which is that recipient governments are able to request these projects directly from China's government. So rather than dealing with uh, you know, technocratic bureaucracies in these developing countries, China's government mostly prefers to deal with heads of state and high level leaders. And what we end up finding is that, especially in places like Sub-Saharan Africa, a lot of these projects uh, get concentrated heavily in the birth regions of political leaders. And so what that means effectively is that aid projects aren't flowing to the parts of countries that have the greatest material need. They often end up in wealthier provinces or wealthier states. Um, one of the reasons why this can happen is that compared to say the World Bank, China's government doesn't have nearly as robust of institutional safeguards to discourage this kind of behavior. And so in addition to all these statistical tests we do in the different chapters, 
We look at a number of different kind of country cases and instances of this as well. And we look at how in places like Sri Lanka and Sierra Leone, these host country political processes play out and bias you know, the, the, the geographic allocation of these projects. And what's a little bit concerning is that we don't find any evidence of this distortion for World Bank finance projects. And when it comes to China's portfolio, it's really the aid projects that are driving this result. Um, debt projects, again, follow more of a commercial logic within host countries. So we don't find that those projects are going more to, uh, to, to, to say, the birth regions of political leaders. Um, and I should also say the effect is strongest, not only in Africa, but um, in countries that have competitive elections, and in particular in the lead up to those competitive elections. That's when we see this kind of strategic allocation effect as being, as being strongest. So turning to the effects of these projects, not just where they go, but what do they actually do once, once they begin, um, we actually start by looking at China's economy. And it's a long standing challenge in the study of aid and, 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 and uh, uh, political economy of development to try to understand whether and how aid promotes growth and promotes development because there's all types of other factors that matter. There's all types of selection challenges to identification. For example, it's very possible that a donor uh, might give most of its projects to a region that's already better off or worse off. And so it's hard to isolate the effects of aid. And so to try to you know, have strong effects and, and identify strong effects, either positive or negative of China's development finance, we look at shifts in China's own economy. And the intuition here is that when China launched the going out strategy at the end of the 1990s, it basically integrated to a pretty intimate degree its own development strategy with its global development strategy. And so we end up using just kind of intuitively, we use an instrumental variables approach that has two parts. And the first part is meant to capture um, variation only over time that changes each year, but doesn't change over space. And so specifically what we do is that we look at China's excess production, excess capacity of things like steel, and cement and iron and a number of these commodities that um, that that China in the 2000s produced a lot of excess capacity in. And eventually China's government decided that one of the strategies to try to offset this excess capacity was to essentially not export it, but to use it in China's development projects. And so it did this in a couple of ways. It encouraged uh, uh, China's policy banks to uh, sign deals in which um, funding would be contingent on, um, you know, tied kind of purchases of these of these inputs, and it also tried to encourage offshoring of the production of these as well. And so, intuitively, in in years in which there's more excess capacity, we expect there to be a larger just overall global volume of China's development finance, especially in the year after. And then, similarly, as an alternative measure, we look at China's uh, foreign currency reserves and. This is also a situation where China's policy banks were mandated by China's government to kind of use some of these and manage these um, in overseas development projects and, and go out in search of returns. So similarly, in years when currency reserves are especially high, we expect, you know, in the future, the global volume of China's development finance to be greater. So we take this measure of kind of the overall availability of China's development finance in a given year. And then we interact that with uh, different countries and then different subnational regions level of exposure uh, historically to Chinese projects. And so the intuition is that if the overall supply of China's development finance increases, some parts of the world are gonna be differentially affected by that because historically certain countries and, and, and certain regions within countries are more likely or less likely to get, uh, to get projects from China. And so the logic is, similar to a difference and differences design where we're trying to exploit this differential impact of uh, a surplus in Chinese project inputs on development finance to places in the world with different levels of exposure to Chinese projects. And the instrument turns out to be very strong. And um, just for time limitations, I'm just going to highlight three key kind of findings in terms of the effects of these projects. So what we find when we put everything together is that this efficacy versus safety trade-off is very real. So both aid and debt from China has positive effects on development. Um, these results hold at the global level. They increase short-term economic growth 
nationally in terms of GDP per capita, and they do subnationally as well when we look at uh, things like changing you know, nighttime lights within subnational regions too. We benchmark all of our analyses with, uh, with tests for the World Bank as well. And we don't find any evidence that uh, Chinese projects are less effective than World Bank projects, at least in the short term. And we also look specifically at transportation infrastructure projects China, uh, financed by China's government, which are again, kind of hallmark signature belt and road projects. And we find that these projects in particular, as you might expect, they change, they reshape economic activity once they're built and they lower spatial inequality uh, within developing countries. So here's an example of what I mean. This is a highway that China's government financed and built in Kenya between Nairobi and Thika. And what you see on this map here are changes in nighttime lights output uh, between this five year, six year period. And essentially what we find, and this is kind of indicative of the broader results that we get, is that nighttime lights change a lot and economic activity spreads out a lot from big metropolises like Nairobi. And it spreads out along this transportation corridor as things like the cost of transportation, the cost of commuting goes down. We see more economic activity spread to some of these satellite towns, basically on, you know, along this highway. So in the short term, things look pretty good and we find, um, you know, some reasons for optimism. But we also find some negative externalities. Um, and, and again, a lot of these are ones that, that I think a lot of us are well aware of, just given what's happened in recent years. We find a lot of externalities to debt-based financing um, from China's government too. So as I mentioned, debt-based projects or debt finance projects flow very heavily to big corrupt countries. And we find that they tend to exacerbate problems there. So they potentially make corruption worse there. They increase the likelihood of civil conflict. And that could be due to a couple of different reasons. Um, infrastructure can increase state capacity. It can increase the reach of the state, can make confrontations between different groups in society easier. And it can also create grievances locally as well around the project. Um, aid projects do not produce either of these things. They don't increase corruption and they don't increase the likelihood of conflict. Aid projects are also much smaller on average than debt. And in fact, just to go back for a second, when we find these short-term benefits, the, the effects are much larger for debt projects because debt projects are, are much bigger in terms of their financial value and their scope and their time horizon. And so this is why this trade-off between safety and efficacy is so important because it's most acute for these debt, debt-based projects. Um, we also find an important condition, kind of conditioning mediating role for host country governments. Um, one example I guess I can give is that we look at other outcomes besides economic growth as well. We look at health outcomes, we look at environmental outcomes, and we find that Chinese uh, infrastructure projects cause deforestation in the places that they're built. But the results for that are much kind of more severe for, uh, you know, within countries that have weaker uh, environmental regulations and, and legal systems and legal enforcement. Um, and then finally, it's not all bad in the long term. So we don't find that um, that part about the rogue donor narrative about undercutting the work of, say, the United States or the World Bank. We don't find any evidence for that. So we compare the effectiveness of Western aid in countries that get a lot of aid from China and get a lot of debt from China versus countries that don't. Uh, and we don't really find any, any difference, any meaningful difference in the results. So just in the last few minutes, I just want to put this all together before our discussion. We came away from this exercise and from this, this decade uh, with kind of a mixture of um, optimism and concern. So I, I guess we kind of came down in the middle of that, of that uh, debate, right? Um, on the one hand, Chinese aid goes to poor countries that need it. That's good news. That's re a reason for optimism. And there are real material short-term positive growth effects and development effects more generally of Chinese development projects, especially debt projects. There are also reasons for concern that I just mentioned. So aid at the allocation phase is uh, often distorted and, and allocated to uh, uh, in, in suboptimal ways. And debt, similarly, because it's commercially motivated, um, it tends to flow to more corrupt, larger non-democratic countries. And it seems like it can exacerbate problems there as well. So a few final themes that I think we, we can draw from all of this. Um, just like I said at the beginning, China's shift 
towards being more of a banker. And really these days, the shift is even more apparent than it was in 2014, 2015. This means, as we've all seen, there's been a huge increase in big ticket infrastructure in a lot of developing countries. And because of this trade-off between efficacy and safety, um, this, is, this, is a, this is extremely consequential for developing countries and they are the stakes are very high for them essentially, where they have this decision to make over kind of navigating this, this horizon of like short-term material economic benefits, but much less certain um, kind of economic and political risks in the medium and the longer term, many of which are really difficult to predict and, and plan for as well um, because of you know, the inherent challenges that infrastructure presents. Host agency, of course, is really important and we are uh, far from the first people to, to suggest that. There's been a lot of really good work that's been done in the past 10 years that suggests we need to pay a lot more attention to host country governments. This is a big reason why we see so much unevenness in the outcomes of a lot of these projects. And then finally, just one last point, if we fast forward to today, and first of all, if we look at 2017, we see that if we use the latest version of the data set, this trend going from donor to banker has continued to materialize. And aid represents an even smaller share of China's total uh, development finance portfolio today, maybe only 12 or 13 percent, something like that. Um, and if we fast forward to 2022, again, this, this basically has continued. Um, and so these findings, I think, are especially important to think about, given uh, these difficult situations that a lot of developing countries have found themselves in. Uh, and if any of this is uh, particularly interesting to you, 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 you can read on. Uh, the book is 30% off right now if you go to the publisher's website. Uh, but I'll stop there and um, thank you. And I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Austin. This is a fantastic project. Um, and I learned a lot. I, I have a few questions for you. And it it, it is very inspiring and thought provoking. Um, but before we um, so now we'll move on to the discussion park. And I would like to remind the audience, if you have any questions, you can type that in in your Q&A box. And now let, let me give the floor to Matt. Great. Thank you. Um, thank you, Angela, for having me and Austin for and co-authors for the amazing work. Um, and so I, I promised that I would keep my comments pretty high level and so not get in too much to the statistical analysis and a lot of the detail. Um, and so let me just uh, begin with congratulating the authors. on <laughs> What is a tremendous amount of work? And so when we see a book like this and a data collection project like this, we really should all just take a moment to digest um, how long it takes and how, how hard it is and how collaborative um, that sometimes these efforts have to be in order to yield a book like this, which tells us, you know, I have it, I do have it here, I have purchased it, um, but you know, which yields, you know, so much in terms of our understanding of what China is doing in the world. Um, and so I, I want to say a, a few words about why I think this book is, um, a, is per, in particular, a really special contribution to this growing literature on what China is doing in the world and how we're supposed to make uh, sense of China's rise and the effect that it's having on especially countries outside of China, as well as how those interactions between Chinese firms and Chinese agencies outside of China might reverberate within China. So just to underscore, uh, it comes across very clearly when one actually works your way through the chapters of the book, these two um, really important arguments and conclusions that Austin's presentation just highlighted. First, that China has gone over the last 15 years or so from a benefactor to a banker, right? So Chinese development finance is much more aid-driven, especially in volume at this point, instead of just projects. Um, but also that China in its behavior and its allocation of aid, its allocation of debt, and in terms of the impact the projects have um, on local communities is not all that different from the OECD, even though China itself is institutionally quite different from those countries and may lend or, um, or allocate aid according to a different logic, we think, based on its own politics and institutions, but we find that those outcomes are quite similar. And so um, it's been very interesting, you know, even as, a, as, as someone who's dealt with a little bit of China's outward direct um, investment, mostly FDI, which I'll say more about in a moment, but just China's outward capital flows, that I find that I, I have to work very hard <laughs> to basically convince people um, that they need to look at what China's doing um, at, at, in a kind of blank slate, right, to really understand it. Um, and so the confirmation bias for everyone is out there. So, you know, for example, whenever 
you know, people see a project um, and then a project goes a certain way, they assume that it must have gone that way because China has these set of intentions. And so um, it's very difficult to impose analytical order and social scientific order on these data, whether it's one data point, three data points, you know, 10 within one country, et cetera. And so it's really a lot of hard work, but the book basically and the findings just go to underscore the way in which our working assumption should not be that, that China is trying to nefariously ensnare a bunch of countries into um, unequal relationships, but rather that um, it is a global financier that is behaving in some ways similar to those of the past. And of course, all, all global country financiers have their own strategic goals. It's not just China that has them. And so resetting that as a baseline assumption um, is an important impact of this book, although it's one that's very difficult to do. Um, so I, I also want to say at the at the level of um, so, you know, as Austin emphasized, the book is really based on a project level data set. And I've become extremely convinced that in the realm of, o of, of outward foreign direct investment, OFDI, that looking at the project level is also the right unit of analysis. And so we have just massive amounts of data on the aggregate flows between countries, right, or looking at, um, you know, large projects and things like that. Um, whereas if we go at the project level, it has a couple of advantages. One is that we get a more comprehensive picture, obviously, of what um, Chinese investors or, or benefactors or bankers are doing on the ground. And the real problem, which I think is especially prominent in media and political and think tank analyses of China, is that there's a tendency to focus on what some people argue are strategic projects. So looking only at the things that are interesting right, to people like um, like you know, military analysts, et cetera, only looking at ports, only looking at airports. And you miss all of this really important action in terms of you know, the book has such rich data on health and education level, sectoral um, allocations of aid and things like that. And so the lived experience, right, of an average, you know, South, South Asian, Southeast Asian or African who is dealing with Chinese donors or Chinese investors or Chinese lenders is much richer than just looking at these big ticket projects. And so looking at the project level rather than aggregate flows, I think is the right way to do it. Um, it does present some problems in that it's difficult to get, whether it's on the OFDI side or as you say, on the aid or, bet or, or debt side to get exact totals for everything. And so you end up having this mismatch between what you know about flows and financial volumes and what you know about projects. But I think the authors are extremely careful in drawing conclusions um, based on what they know about project level versus about financial flows. Um, so all that said, um, let me uh, just give a few provocations um, and a way, and I know Angela has some questions too. And so, so do I. And so let me start with, um, with thinking about the limits of what we can learn from the large data. So on the one hand, I quite agree with how you started the presentation and how you and co-authors start the book in terms of if someone you know, likes China as a global financier, it's easy to pick projects that show how great China is. And if you don't, it's easy to pick projects that you don't. Also increasingly, it's easy to pick a single country or a single project and impose whatever analytical view, worldview you have, whether you know it fits the facts or doesn't. So fitting basically the facts into your worldview rather than developing a worldview from the facts. And so, um, so I agree that, you know, so better data, um, more comprehensive data, higher quality data is all, is all necessary. Um, but there are limits in some ways. And so let me just say something about that. So first, it seems like, you know, when we analyze at the project level, we assume a kind of unit homogeneity in a social scientific, you know, statistical sense that each project has a similar ontology, right? Um, and also we assume a unit independence, which is to say, you know, that basically that how I allocate a health project here doesn't affect how I allocate an education project here or that I have a debt finance infrastructure project here has nothing to do right with a bunch of other aid financed projects here. And I think neither um, unit homogeneity nor unit independence is really how we should think of what China is doing or really any international donor or financier in a particular country. Um, so projects might not have the same ontology. And there are just a couple of different ways. When we think about you know, the entire package of what a set of Chinese firms or the Chinese state wants to achieve in a particular country, those interests get really intertwined. And so I've written publicly about Sri Lanka, the case that I know the best, where you know, the international media has obsessed about the port in Sri Lanka because it seems a very sexy, militarily relevant kind of project. But in fact, 
you know, a Chinese firm invested as equity investor, a much higher volume of capital in a real estate development. Um, and its interest may have been much more, uh, much deeper and had much more on the line in that equity investment, but because it was real estate, no one really cared. And so they made a bunch of inferences from one set of debt finance projects with, while ignoring the investment projects. And I think it misses the entire picture of what Chinese firms and, you know, and Chinese banks have at stake in a country like Sri Lanka. And so in that sense, I think there are limits to, to the conclusions that we can draw about that. Um, it's also true, I think that, and, you know, I think in the book, the authors are very attentive to this and some of the limitations of their data and anyone's data on what China is, right? So China as a monolith, of course, there's a, diff a bunch of different, you know, ministries, actors, you know, subgroups within different ministries, as well as the Chinese firms themselves, whose interests are often competing and overlapping and sometimes at odds with the Chinese state. Um, but these different Chinese actors want to do different things. And so, you know, one thing I was struck by um, in Southeast Asia in 2016, 2017, when I was traveling there, is how many of these projects were really kind of pet projects from different ministries within China and different groups within China who were lobbying for certain things, right? And so a lot of the time it was like, well, you know, we realized if we got this project, it, it's really small in the Philippines, but we could prove ourselves and get something bigger. And so um, so in that sense, you know, the, the actual argument for the impact and what should it be, right, may be a, a different set of things because we're dealing with bureaucratic politics. That's true. I think everywhere. But um, I do think in order to get, you know, the, this project is what it is, and it's terrific, right, for what it is. But in terms of where the research agenda ought go for all of us trying to understand China's impact on the world, I do want to advocate for what we might think of as middle range theory. So looking at you know, in the context of projects with this ontology and countries like this, what can we say? And so um, so there's a, I mean, I, I tend to be really ecumenical when it comes to how, what kind of, we, we know so little that any kind of research, well, not any kind of research, but, you know, it's an all hands on deck type situation. And so there's a certain set of inferences I think we can make from big data like this or pretty big data like this. Um, but there's still a place, right, for interrogation at the country level or comparing sectors um, or doing this kind of middle range theory um, to understand basically from the ground up, how are things playing out? What is the logic of these different projects, et cetera? The other thing that I wanted to say, and first I wanna congratulate the authors. I think there's a tremendous amount of work out there right now on basically, is China getting what it wants um, from sending its money abroad? And there's a lot of problems with that. <laughs> Some of that work is very good, but there's a lot of it is not as high quality. And I think part of the problem is that um, first of all, there's a Chinese dollar isn't just a, a dollar, right? And so looking at aid versus debt, which this book does very well, but leaves out investment, which, well, you know, it's fair enough, you can't do everything, but the investment matters a lot. And I'll, I'll, I'll conclude with that in just a, a minute. Um, but basically, you know, the, the question of does China get what it wants? This book is, and, and the, the, the way that people look at that is sometimes to say, again, with the UN General Assembly voting, which this book does very well, or, you know, do they say certain things about Taiwan? Do they do these certain things? And I think um, I want to just invite us to think about how that's a pretty crude, not in this book, but in general, asking is China getting what it wants by ensnaring countries, et cetera. It's a crude vision of politics. And so I want to go back to Albert Hirschman wrote this book in 1945 about asymmetric economic relationships. And, you know, that he had sort of two different ideas. One is, you know, do you have power over? Can I make a country do what I want it to do? And I think a lot of social scientists right now are trying to study that in China's context. But the different set of questions, right, might be how do asymmetric economic relationships or even just changing economic relationships, so the presence of a large Chinese debt project, how does it reorganize domestic politics in a way that generates outcomes that China may not want, right, um, but that basically are, are either unintentional or maybe partially intentional and sometimes accrue power to China, sometimes do not. And so there's some really rich material in here, for example, on the Kenya Standard Gauge Railway and also on Sri Lanka, um, also looking at Myanmar and other countries, right? Thinking about how the presence of China or the large influx of Chinese capital, whether it's coming through mostly through debt in this particular book, has kind of reorganized some domestic politics in different places. And so one observation I have is that it seems like places where actually ironically, 
politics are a bit more open, right? So there is domestic competition in elections, which is certainly the case, right, for Kenya and for Sri Lanka, where these projects easily get politicized. And in fact, you know, things could go poorly for China. And so that's sort of the conclusion, I think, for the Kenya SGR project in the book. And so then thinking about how host country institutions interact, not just in terms of whether host countries are democratic or not democratic, but do they have, for example, a free press, right? How competitive are elections? That's, that is a variable that is in the book. And so I think there's a lot here for people who are interested in those questions to take and think about how China's actions are reorganizing politics. The last thing um, I'll say, right, has to do with the time frame that we're looking at, right? And so um, it's a very interesting uh, set of questions, you know, is China's finance getting China what it wants in the world? And that's not necessarily the, the main question of the book. The main question of the book is what its effect is having on local communities. And, um, and th this work and the journal articles that it's based on is the, the gold standard in doing that kind of work. Um, but, you know, we, I, I think of an analogy, which is this long 20th century project to look at whether sanctions work. And, you know, we end up coming up with, you know, all these interesting measures of do they get countries to do what the sanctions want them to do? Well, we have no idea, right? What they do is they end up, you know, completely reorganizing politics in a certain place and producing outcomes that are very long term. And so, you know, thinking about what China is doing in that way and continuing to collect this data and then thinking, you know, I like the last chapter where it's like, so let's do a thought experiment about the Belt and Road in 2033, right? And so taking a very long term view of understanding what China's effect is um, on, on places and, and lastly on China. And the last provocation is really just about investment. And again, it's not fair. I study I study outward foreign direct investment. So of course, that's what I'm interested in. That's not what this book is about. And then so now I don't want to be the person who's like, well, but you didn't do investment. Okay, you can't write a book on everything. So I won't, um, I won't be that person. But I do think one thing I'm observing, and many people are observing in the field is now that China, now maybe there's a separate transition that's happening. So it has been from benefactor to banker. And now we're seeing from banker to investor, where in fact, right, we're seeing the reining in of, um, of debt finance infrastructure projects. And instead, Chinese SOEs in particular are looking much more to equity investment. And so I wonder how you think some of your findings might carry to equity investment. And so if we were to think then of, you know, the Chinese state or Chinese companies or, you know, Chinese actors making that transition, um, what else would we need to know in addition to just collecting project level um, data on investment? And do you think the tough methodology would be a good methodology for investments? I can tell you the data sets we have out there on FDI are just as weak as some of the data sets that you, you know, were un unhappy with and therefore inspired to build your own. And so, um, so looking, do you think that methodology would work for investment? Would it be the same, you know, set of questions that you would ask? And do you observe, in fact, this transition from banker to, or benefactor to banker, and now perhaps um, to equity investor. And so um, I've learned a lot and I enjoyed getting a chance to really dig into the book. And so I will leave it there and um, hear what Angela has to say and, and look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mac. Um, well, um, Austin, would you take a couple of minutes to, to respond to Matt's feedback first? Sure, I can do that. I'm going to have to try to control my time. There's so many interesting things to talk about. <laughs> Should I? So I'll respond to Meg first then, and then we can take more questions. Okay, good. Um, well, first of all, thank, thank you so much for the engagement and the deep engagement. Um, all three, I think you asked three kind of core questions, and they're all extremely thought provoking. And um, believe it or not, I may not, may not seem this way after you read the book, but I I feel the same way as you do about about some of these. So um, on the first one, I completely agree. And this has been um, a very educational process. So there are any singular type of data source has its limits, right? Any methodological approach, approach has its limits. And it's important to be transparent about what those are. Um, and so absolutely, we inevitably, oops, we inevitably lose, um, you know, potentially really important nuance when we aggregate things, right? And, and the type of analysis that we do in the book, and just for anyone in the audience who hasn't read it yet, um, a lot of the, the analysis is statistical analysis where we're using this big data set. Um, we can partially address this, right, from kind of an econometrics point of view. You know, we can say, well, look, we look at the effects by sector, or we do control for project co-location and things like that. But I think to a lot of us, that's not, really satisfying, especially for those of us who 
know the, the 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 details about the context and then the actual details of projects and not not to make a shameless plug but i have a follow-up shorter book that i'm writing myself on chinese global infrastructure and it very much builds in this direction that i think you're you're describing which is um, not completely the same way i i still think it is important uh to look at some of these high profile projects but um but doing so in more of kind of a singular nodal way not just in an aggregated way as well um so whether it's that or looking at different government ministries um, i completely agree and then you know i think just to this is this is a, a book on its own but i think when we started this project our uh and i want to speak for the others but I, I think this is probably true you know we envisioned it being part of this big ecosystem kind of mixed methods um interdisciplinary and i think that's happened i mean i think this space has gotten a lot better than, than it was 10 or 15 years ago so so i completely agree uh, i'll just i'll just say that for for because of time limitations i also agree with what you said about whether china gets what it wants this is a recurring problem in international relations is who can come up with the best measure of chinese influence uh, i've written about this at this point a lot of people have written about this so i think about this a lot as well um in in the book i just mentioned the forthcoming book which will hopefully be out next year i actually i agree with your point about reshaping domestic activity in host countries and i i i'm trying to go in a different direction than kind of the hirschman-esque approach where you look at things like structural power and i'm trying to look at unintended consequences because what i've come to learn is that if you actually contextualize the study of chinese infrastructure um, you quickly find that infrastructure everywhere, not just Chinese infrastructure, is very, very messy. Operationally, financially, it creates multi-dimensional um, social and political and economic effects. And I think, not to go off on a tangent, but when we think about assessing the BRI, I think that's extremely difficult to do right now because a lot of these projects are only coming online. It's going to take years to, to be able to accurately assess what the net effects of these infrastructure projects are. So anyway, I, I guess I would just say I generally I'm really sympathetic to that point. And then maybe just for, for time purposes, we could uh, chat at some point in the future about investment data sets. Um, I'll just make one high level comment for now on this point about banker to investor. Um, it's certainly possible. And, and I've, I've seen kind of work in that style like you're talking about. I think it makes sense. And if you look at this, evolution from donor to banker and then whether or not the next step is investor i think what you see is all along um the key start of this process is the linkage of china's national economic priorities to its approach to global development um and so i think its its strategy or strategies to financing development activities whether that's through um you know debt financed you know policy bank loans whether that's through more equity taking, we're seeing a lot of Chinese companies do this now as well. Um, I think the the underlying basic commercial logic is there. So I guess my my initial reaction is it's a bigger step from donor to banker than it is from banker to investor. If I had to kind of speculate at this point, but I but I'm not but I'm not super confident about that yet. Um, but I'll I'll stop there and we can see if others have questions. Oh, well, thank you, Austin. Uh, we have a lot of questions from our engaging audience, so I wouldn't take long. Um, look, I mean, this is a fascinating book. And interestingly, when I was reading the book, um, I thought the story is not necessarily a donor to a banker, because uh, for the most part, I feel China is a supplier. And um, because of China's overcapacity problem, it need to sell a lot of the uh, basic uh, materials, infrastructure materials to uh, the whole state. And then they try to create a demand and persuade those countries to buy those stuff. And that's why, you know, they extend the debt to those countries. So it's kind of like a supply chain financing story that we're looking here. And China created demand uh, by, you know, supporting those, those projects uh, to some extent. Um, so, and, and, and if we look at it that way, it, it will have implications for, um, you know, what, what you think it's going to happen uh with the trajectory of china's debt financing in the future because if china's uh overcapacity problem persists they still have a lot of stuff uh, at home that cannot sell and they have to sell it somewhere they will have to have have to continue to face the economic pressure um to to sustain this kind of debt financing even though a few projects has has gone sour 
And, and that also relates to the question, uh, one of the questions from my audience about what do you think is going to happen with China's this kind of debt financing in, in the long term, and also relates to Matt's uh, comment about, you know, would China switch from a, uh, a, a banker to an investor? Because I, for the most part, I view China as a supplier. Um, you know, what you see, the financing is only on the surface. The deeper motivation is that China need to sell the stuff that they cannot consume. And, and it, it creates the demand uh, for this. I don't know whether you want to respond because we're running out of time and you can pick, cherry pick a few questions, uh, maybe in the Q&A um, um, to-, to Sure, respond. sure. I'm happy to respond to yours. And then with whatever time we have left, I can try to do some more. I'll try, I'll try to be brief. Um, but we're talking about big, big things, so it can be it can be tough. But so, um, so I, I, I definitely see what you mean, um, and I think the reason why, from an international development perspective, um, you know, we chose something like the term banker rather than supplier, goes back to one one of Meg's comments as well, which is a lot of this is about development projects, um, not just the flows. And so I agree with you that overcapacity, I mean, I, I hope I agree. That's a big part of our empirical strategy, that overcapacity is a really important part of the story. And I'm certainly on the side of, uh, I'm someone who believes it's really these, these national economic problems and priorities that drove the BRI, not geopolitical influence. I think um, I think the former was much more important, but I think ultimately, um, when you look at these projects, they um, I, I would I, I would be more inclined to consider them as having kind of composite motivations behind them, a number of different commercial motivations, not just getting rid of overcapacity, um, and certainly not just political influence either. So, so I guess that's my response to that, and and then somewhat relatedly, um, I get, I also agree with your your sentiment, which is that. If overcapacity persists, um, I think we ought to be a little bit more cautious than we're seeing some people be right now about kind of the fate of the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, I think there are a lot of premature kind of conclusions that are being made, um, and I have some thoughts on that. But but I also don't want to crowd out anyone's <laughs> anyone's questions. Um, do you want to read any of these questions to me, or what would be the best way to proceed here? Uh, we have a lot of questions. Um, we have seven questions. I don't know whether you have a chance to take take a look at any one of oh, them and may maybe pick a couple that you would like to to answer because we're sure, running sure. out of time. Yeah, just give me one second. Okay, so Wait. I'm gonna. Yeah, go ahead. Was, there's a question by Tridi. Kumar Mitra here, which yeah. um, I was looking exactly this one. <laughs> that's the closest one to what we're talking about. So it's, yes. it's a good flow. So I'll, I'll try to be brief, but just a few thoughts on um, this question, which is about uh, kind of what do you expect for the budget for the BRI, given, you know, these various economic crises and problems. So just building on what what Angela mentioned, um, you know, I, I think and I think this is important because it's kind of an update on, on what we talk about in the book. So I think most of us would agree that the BRI is in a period of, of kind of recalibration and lending volumes. And, and if you want to put it like the question is asked, the budget is, at least for now, it's much smaller than it's been, um, you know, during the study period that we looked at. There's been backlash to the BRI, but at just a few points. So I think the BRI is certainly here to stay for a while. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, infrastructure has a very long time horizon. So it's too early to assess these projects. It's also true that uh, even though China may be kind of converging to the behavior of other donors in some ways, it's still really one of or the only game in town for financing big infrastructure. And a lot of developing countries still want that. Um, I agree with Angela that the economic rationale on China's side is still in place, at least for some of these projects. Um, and we haven't even talked about the fact that infrastructure, the BRI is, is, is vague, right? This leaves room for recalibration, for reinterpretation, Things like digital infrastructure and the digital Silk Road are part of this as well. Infrastructure is a very big term. Um, so I guess that, that would be my response to you, Tradeeb, is um, it looks like the budget has shrunk for the time being, but um, I, I think a lot of the kind of structural factors that led to the BRI in the first place are still in place. So we may see a BRI that looks a little different, but we're still gonna see uh, a BRI. Um, can try to take another one here. I mean, the first question from Raymond Gao asking, during your research, did you find some evidence that China intends to export its regulatory approach or governance model abroad? 
Th Raymond, thank you for the question. This is not something we looked at in the book. It's not something I've researched myself. Um, I'm aware of some other some other research on this by you know colleagues and and other scholars. Um, people like Lena Ben Abdallah are doing good work on on this type of question. Um, and I guess the short answer is um, at the there's some interesting work at the party level, which I think is an important kind of thing to look at for the type of question that you're interested in. Um, where if we're talking about a model, a governance model, if there is if there is one, um, uh, there are there's a lot of party diplomacy that happens between China's uh, Communist Party and different political parties, both not of course not just communist parties but democratic parties lots of different political parties in developing countries as well so there's party to party diplomacy in addition to state to state diplomacy so what we don't really do much of in the book is look at these people to people interactions but uh, lena's work and, and others work that's where i would point you um to, to get some more kind of insight on that great uh would, would you like to pick one more questions um to answer before we conclude the book talk yeah, absolutely. And, and feel free to pick one for me. I, I've got the chat here. I'm, I'm looking through. I can just go to the second one if it's easiest. Um, okay. So some speculations about China's future investment and in aid to foreign countries. Given China's politically motivated system and changeable relationship with the Western world. So this is a good question because we haven't talked about the West's response to China, which is an important part of this. So maybe, maybe I'll just say a little bit about that. So um, China's politically motivated system, I'm, I'm not 100% clear what you mean, but I just think that the basic response I would give is that the huge point that we try to bring across in the book, Edward, is that some of China's development finance is politically motivated and some of it isn't. Um, a lot of it's commercially motivated now. But maybe I'll focus on the second part of your question, which is this, this, the Western world and, and kind of you know, tensions in US-China relations and things like that. So um, this is another reason why I think um, the BRI is going to be a little bit more resilient than a lot of people think right now. Um, there have been a number of kind of multilateral uh, infrastructure alternatives that have been pitched and released and branded and rebranded in the past couple of years um, by the G7 in particular. Right now, it's called what uh, PGII, um, and there's huge doubts about whether or not something like this will ever materialize. Um, uh, for, for a number of reasons, people worry, people wonder about where the funding for this type of thing will come from. Um, you know, infrastructure in these Western countries is quite poor. This is, doesn't seem to be something that they have a comparative advantage in. So this is another thing I didn't mention, but just to kind of close here, I, I, I also feel that, and, and this isn't something that we tangibly look at in the book, this is just my own opinion. People are often curious about what China's development model or identity is. And I, I feel pretty strongly that infrastructure is really one of China's calling cards uh, it, for its reputation in global development. And I think that might mean something. So as we think about kind of the BRI being uh, recalibrated and retrofitted, I'm not so sure that just because right now, you know, the global economy is struggling and kind of the going is tough. I don't think China's government is ready to give up infrastructure as something that it has a clear comparative advantage in. I think this is something that uh, China's government is probably very proud of. I think this is one of the positive sources of good reputation in China's global development pro uh, program. Um, and so I think this is something that China can point to and say, look, we do this thing really well. And yes, infrastructure creates a lot of problems. Um, but again, there's a huge infrastructure gap. This is part of the SDGs. This is a huge part of the story and we're the only game in town. So we welcome others to provide it. Um, but until you can, you know, this is our comparative advantage. So there is something reputational going on there as well. I think I can't quite put my finger on it, but I, but I think it's important. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Austin and, and Mac uh, to join us for this fascinating book talk. Just to uh, reiterate, this is a this is a must read for anyone who cares about China's development finance and, and get it. It's it's not expensive. How much is it, Austin, on Amazon? I think it's 30 or $35, but it's okay, on yeah, sale. It's like it's so it's even 30 cheaper. and $35, yeah. Yeah, you can learn, you know, almost everything you you uh, you need to know. I mean, get the, the, the like really the, the, the introduction 
uh, into into this um, uh, book. And so, so thank you everyone for joining us, and um, and let's congratulate Austin and his co-authors for for their wonderful work and wonderful and really hard work um, as well. And uh, and thanks, Mac, for joining us from 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 Boston. It's very early for you. Really appreciate that. And 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 that's it. Thank you. Good night. Bye bye, everybody.